Hey everyone, welcome back to Computer Science 340. Today we're going to be talking about the Breadth First Search Algorithm, or BFS for short. This algorithm uses a queue in order to search through some kind of multi-dimensional search space. It can be used for lots of different kinds of search problems. The one we'll look at today, because it's kind of simple and straightforward, is searching through a maze. So you start at the beginning of the maze and you need to search through and find a path to the end. Then we'll talk about a very, very similar algorithm called the depth first search algorithm. The steps of these algorithms are extremely similar. In fact, they're identical, except that the difference is what data structure is being used to keep track of where you are in the maze. One of them uses a queue, that's breadth first search, and the other one uses a stack, that's depth first search. So this is kind of a cool thing because we've learned these different data structures and now we can sort of like radically transform the way the algorithm works as we're gonna see, not by changing any of the code or any of the steps of what we're doing, but just by changing the underlying data structure that we're using. Then at the very end of today, I'm gonna to talk just a little bit about a, um, Another, another type of data structure called a priority queue, just as sort of like foreshadowing because we're going to get to another data structure that um, implements this priority queue idea that I'm gonna talk about at the end of today. So let's go ahead and get started by talking about breadth first search. All right, so like I said, we're gonna start talking about the breadth first search algorithm. Now this algorithm can be used to search lots of different types of problems, but we're gonna use mazes as an example. And the way it works is we have sort of our search space, which I've drawn this kind of like rough maze here on the screen so we can use it as an example to talk about. And you also keep track of a queue. And what the queue does is it keeps track of the possible things that you have left to search that you haven't yet searched. So we're going to begin in the beginning and we're always going to look around us and see what ways we can go, what new areas can we search that we haven't already searched. And for each one that we find, we're going to add it to a queue. So it's going to look kind of weird, but I'm just going to draw an R for right and in queue that in our queue here. We're also going to mark the position that we've just visited, which is right now the starting position, so that we know we won't come back there. So the only way we can go right now is right. We can't go up or down because those are walls and we can't go left because that's off the edge of the maze. Then what we're going to do is we're going to dequeue from the queue the next position that we have to go, which is this right position. And so that's going to move us over here. Then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look and examine what ways we can go around us. We can't go back because that's been marked. It's been X'd off. That's why we do that. We sort of like leave a little breadcrumb or something so that we know we've been here. We can't go up or down because those are walls, but we can go right again. So again, we in queue that right position and then find that that's the only one we can go. And so we de queue it off again. Again, we mark where we currently are and then go right. And then this process repeats itself. We're going to look around us and see we can't go left because that was where we've been. We can't go down because there's a wall. We can't go right because there's a wall, but we can go up. So we in queue up into our queue. And so far our queue is only storing one thing at a time. So it's not really seeming that important right now, but it's gonna become important once we have these forks in the road that are coming up. So we mark our position that we are in right now again, and we then choose the next position we're going to go by dequeuing it out of the queue, which is this up position. So next we go up here. Now we're left in the same position. We mark where we've been like that again, and then we look and see we can't go down, we can't go left, we can't go right, but we can go up. So we in queue that. And then we find that that's the only one we can go. So we dequeue it out again. And that gives us this position for our next step in the maze. Now, finally, we got to an interesting part. I maybe should have drawn the maze different so there was a fork sooner, but now we have a fork. And so now we look and see we can't go left or down, of course, because left is a wall and down is where we've been, but we can go up. So we in queue that, and we can also go right. So we in queue that as well. And so now we mark this position we've been at, and now we dequeue from the queue one of the things that we've pushed in. And the way I did it here is I enqueued the up position first and then enqueued right. And so the one we dequeue first then is going to be the up position. So we're gonna pull that out of the queue and go up next right here. 
So now when we get to this up position, we haven't forgotten about the right position down here that we were supposed to search because it's still in our queue and it's gonna be confusing because I'm just writing up, left, right, and down, but we'll remember that that is the right position for right here that we're supposed to go in. I'll mark it as maybe R1. So now what we're doing is we're going to do the same thing. We mark this position because we visited it and then we look around us to see which way we can go. We can't go up, or rather we can't go down, left, or right, but we can go up. So now we're going to in queue up. And I'm gonna mark this with a two so that we remember this is sort of like the second path here and this is the first path here. So now we do the same thing again. We dequeue the next position to go in, which is this R1. So that's gonna get dequeued and we're going to go over here. Then our queue is gonna be updated like this with this U2 position, which refers to this cell, still in the queue, but our current position now over here. And so now we have the situation where we can't go left or right, but we can go up and down from this position. And so we're going to in queue into the queue, the up, which I'll call up one, I guess, because I'm calling this the first path, even though we went to it second. And then this is up two is over here. So again, it's getting kind of confusing. When we do this for real, we'll use like real coordinates, but just to demonstrate up two is this position here and up one is this position here. But then we also have to in queue a down position on path one because we can go down from our current location, which again is right here in this cell. Then we mark the position that we've been in and then we dequeue our next position from the queue which is this U2 right here. That leaves us in this position, and then we're going to dequeue this from the queue, which will leave it like this. So that now our current position is here, but we've remembered that we need to go to this U1 position and this D1 position. Then we see, don't worry, I'm not gonna go through this whole maze like this, it would take too long. Then we go ahead and do the same thing. We mark the position that we're in currently, and then we keep track of what we need to visit next, pushing those spots onto our queue. So the next one we have to do is this R position. So I'm going to in queue R2 into our queue for this spot right here. Then though, we go ahead and we dequeue the next position we want to look at out of our queue, which is U1. So next we're gonna travel over here and pop this out of our queue. Then we're in sort of a dead end. We mark this as being visited, but we can't go anywhere else from here. So we stop at that point and DQ the next position that we're going to go in, which is D1, which is down here. So we go down here and then we in queue the positions from here that we can get, which is not left, right, or up, but down. So we're going to in queue the D1 position actually, which is what we're, we're currently on as well. So then we're going to basically, essentially, each time we look at a position, we're going to in queue the next ones around it. And because a queue is a first in, first out data structure, we're basically doing this in the breadth first way, meaning we do a broad search. We don't commit ourselves to any one of these paths. We explore them taking turns one after another. So next we're going to go to this position. Then we're gonna to go to this position, then here, then here, then here, then here. And we sort of explore these paths little by little. Because of the way a queue works, each time we get to a new location with a fork in the road, like right here, we're going to in queue both directions, the right direction and the down direction. And because a queue is first in, first out, we then are going to explore those little by little as we go. That's the basic idea behind what we're doing here. So let's look at it as an algorithm, and then we'll go ahead and look at some actual Java code for this. So here's the pseudocode for this algorithm given on the notes page for today. So the first thing we do is we set the current position that we're keeping track of to the starting position. In the search, there always has to be a starting place for your search. And in this case, it'll be the beginning of the maze. Then in this search, what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep looping until we get to the end position. So while we're not in the end position, here's our steps. We mark the current cell as visited. Then we check if we can go left. Really, this is a little bit vague. It says if we haven't gone left, um, but also we have to make sure that left is a valid path. So if we can go left, in queue left into our queue. 
If we can go right and queue right into our queue, if we can go up and queue up into our queue, if we can go down and queue down into our queue. And then we check if the queue is empty. If the queue is empty at any point, then that means there must not be any path through this maze to the end goal. And so therefore we should abort the process. Otherwise, we get our current position by dequeuing the next thing out of our queue. Then if we get all the way to the end, then we must have made it. So now let's look at some Java code that implements this algorithm. So here I have a bfs.java file, which I'll link to you on the notes page. And this uses Java's built-in queue. The way that queues work in Java is actually kind of interesting. Queue is not really a class in Java, it's just an interface. So if you remember from 240, an interface is like a class in that you can declare things of type queue, but you can't actually create interfaces. You have to find a class that implements that interface. And this allows you in Java to basically select whether you want your queue to be array-based or whether you want it to be linkless based. You can choose either implementation for it. And so we import both of these things. And then when we make our queue, we declare it as a queue object like this. So we can use in queue and DQ, but we actually make it as an array deck, which is a uh, data structure that stands for double ended queue, DE for double ended and then Q for queue. So we chose that implementation, but you can also use, I think just linked list here and that would work as well. And then you have a linked list based queue. So like I said, when we were doing the maze example on the whiteboard, it got kind of confusing because I was just saying up, left, right, and down. So in order for us actually to be able to keep track of where we are in the maze in this program, I made a little 2D point class that keeps track of an X and a Y location and just basically has a constructor so you can set those up. Then in order for us to be able to have our maze, I have made this little maze array of strings and the hyphens are paths and the pound signs or hashtags, I guess if you're generation Y, the hashtags are walls. And so we start in this upper left-hand corner and we need to navigate our way through the maze down to the bottom right-hand corner. So that's the little path right here. And of course there's a couple of paths and dead ends, like we can go down here and get stuck. So I put it in this sort of string format in order for it to be easier to see the actual maze, but then I went ahead and converted it into an array of characters to make it easier to loop through. So the first step of our algorithm was to set the current position to the starting position. And so, like I said, I just defined it that that would be zero, zero here. So we set current equal to a new point at zero, zero right up here. Then we go ahead and loop through while we're not at the end position, which again, I've sort of just like hard coded as this very rightmost spot, which is column 17 and row seven. So we're just keeping track that we're not at the end position. And then we mark the spot we're currently at with a star. So as we're going through this, we are going to overwrite the cells that we've been at with a star as we're sort of passing through it. That's just to keep track of where we are so we don't double back on ourselves like the algorithm talks about. Then we print out the maze to the screen. That's just so we can see where we are at any current point. Oops, I was uh, actually wrong. We uh, mark the spot with a star so we can see what our current location is, and then we mark it as seen with an X. Then we begin the main operation of the algorithm, which is to check if we can go left, and if so, in queue left. So we check if the spot where we're standing with the Y position, so we leave Y alone right here, but we subtract one from X. That means to the left in coordinates. If that spot is equal to a path, so that means it's not a wall and it's also not somewhere we've already X'd out. Then we add that to the queue by saying queue.add the new point, which is one to the left of where we're at with X minus one. Then we do the same thing for right. If right isn't out of bounds and it's equal to a path, then we go ahead and in queue the spot to the right. And the same thing for the bottom with Y plus one. And then the same thing for above us with Y minus one. Then if the queue is empty, then that means there was no way through the maze, like I said, and we just print out that there was no path found and quit out. Otherwise, we get the next step of the maze from our queue, the next place that we're going, and go back up to the top of the loop again. It's a pretty simple algorithm, really, but it relies on this queue to keep track of the possible spaces that we have yet to search. Then at the end, we just print out that we got to the end and we're done. So let's compile and run this thing and sort of trace through what's happening. All right, so I'll do Java C 
on this bfs.java file and then run it and it runs through and finds the end. But the interesting thing that I want to go through with you is sort of how it does it. So if you look, we have this asterisk character, which is where we're currently at, our current position in the maze. The way the algorithm works is it looks around and sees where we can go, and there's only one spot, which is the cell one below us, this cell here. So we enqueue that in the queue, then pop it right back off the queue because that's the only thing there. And that brings us to this cell here. And now things get interesting because we're going to enqueue both the cell to the right of us and also the cell below us. And it doesn't really matter which one gets enqueued first, it's just based on the order of those if statements. But it looks like we enqueued the one to the right of us first because that's where we go next, to the cell one to the right. Then we enqueue this cell right here, but this one is already on the queue. And because it's a queue, this one was first in, so that one's gonna be first out. So after exploring this right cell over here, we go down and explore the down path. Then we go back and explore the right path, and then we go back and explore the down path. We switch between going right and going down, exploring both paths sort of in parallel, in tandem, switching back and forth between one and the other. That's why this is called breadth first search, because we do a broad search. We don't commit to any one of the paths right away. We explore them both, going back and forth between them. Then if we skip down ahead a little bit, we're going to see that we turn right here and we now are exploring between this path and this path, going back and forth between the two until this path runs out, which happens down here. And then we're left with only this path. And so we go down a few times and oops, I, a little too fast. Then we see that there's another fork in the road here. And then again, in parallel, we do this right path over here and this down path down here and explore out broadly, searching both of them until we hit all dead ends. And then it turns out that we explored the entire maze before we found our way through to the very end and then got to 17.7. So that's the breadth first search algorithm and it's based on using a queue. So in addition to using data structures in like sort of obvious positions, when you know you need to keep track of a bunch of data and you know keep track of like student records or employee records or some kind of thing like that. Data structures often also come really in handy when you're doing things with algorithms. So this search algorithm, it might not be immediately obvious off the bat that you need a data structure to store the places that you need to search still in the maze, but you actually do. And in fact, having a good knowledge of data structures will let you more easily write algorithms like this. Now, a queue isn't the only thing we could use to implement this algorithm, though, which brings us to talking about depth-first search. So let's go back to our whiteboard and draw the maze out for that and see what using a stack will do. All right, so let's talk about that. Actually, wait, it's not breadth-first search. There we go. It's depth-first search now. So now, instead of using a queue, we're going to be using a stack to keep track of the cells in this maze that we still have to search. So the basics of the algorithm works exactly identically. The only thing we're changing is the data structure. So again, we're gonna start over here and we're going to look around us and see what areas we can explore in. And so far it's only right. So we're gonna push that on the stack. Then we're going to mark this cell that we're in as being visited and then pop the position off the stack that we need to go next, which is gonna bring us here and bring us into this position. Now again, we're going to see that the next position we need to go is right. So we push the right position onto the stack and mark this area as being visited. Then we're going to pop that off the stack and go in that direction, which will bring us here. And then we're again gonna see we can't go left, right, or down, but we can go up. So we push the up position onto the stack and then pop it right back off again like that to bring us to this up position. Oh, and also mark that we've been here. Then again, we're going to see the only position we can go is up. So we push that onto the stack. We mark that we've been here and then we pop the up off the stack and go there like that. Now again, we see that there's the up position and also the right position that we can go in. So we're gonna push one of them onto the stack first. Maybe we'll push the up position. And then what we're going to do is we're gonna push the right position onto the stack. So we push up and then we push right. 
Now we're going to mark this as being seen again, and then we're going to pop something off the stack to tell us where to go next. Well, that's gonna be the right position, so we're gonna go over here next, which will leave us like that. And then we're going to see that there's two places we can go, up and down. Maybe we push the up first, and I'll do up two, and this one's up one. Um, and then let me just leave these here so we know where it was. Up one was there and up two is there. Then we are gonna push the down position. And then we mark this as being visited and then we pop off the stack the next place that we're going to go, which is going to be down, which will take us down here. Then we again are going to look and see where we can go. We can't go up left or right, but we can go down. So we push that onto the stack and mark where we've currently been. Then we go ahead and again, pop off the stack where we're going next, which is the down position, which brings us down here. And so this is the configuration we're in now. And now if you notice, we haven't gone to this up one position that we saw right off the bat. Instead, we've sort of committed to going and exploring this path to the right instead. Likewise, we haven't gone to this up two location yet. We're going to be going this way. And only when this runs out, because it's a stack, are we gonna go back? So let's see that happen. We're going to explore and see that down is the only place we can go from this current position. So we push down onto the stack, mark that we've been here, and then pop down off the stack, which is gonna bring us down here. Now we look and explore the different ways we can go. We can see that we can go down. So let's push that onto the stack. And we also see that we can go left. So let's push that onto the stack and mark where we're currently at. Now we'll pop our next location off, which is left, which will move us over here. Then we again see, let's mark our current position and we see that we can only go left. So we'll push left onto the stack. Then we go ahead and pop off our next position, which is this left. So we go ahead and do that and move ourselves over here. Mark where we currently are at, look and see where we can go. Right now it's only to the left. So we push that onto the stack. Then we go ahead and pop that off and go left, which brings us over here. And then we mark that we've been there we look and see we can't go up, left, down, or right. And so then we don't push anything in this step. Instead, we go back and pop off the thing that we saw last, which is this D, which was when we went to go down here. So this is our new current position and down gets popped off the stack. So that leaves us in this position here. Well, we're gonna look and we're gonna see that we can go left. So we mark that we've been here. Then we push left onto the stack and then go ahead and pop that off and go left. And so you can see that we're going to follow around this way all the way until we get to the next fork. Then we're gonna choose one of those ways basically based on which order we push the up option and the right option. And whichever one we push last, we're gonna follow first. So it's actually these, if you end up mapped to the same place, but let's say we push right first, then we push up afterwards and we're going to therefore pop up off because it's last in first out. And we're gonna go this way all the way through until we don't have any other option. And only when we hit a dead end back here and have explored this whole area, are we finally gonna pop off the up two that was right here and explore this path. And when we hit a dead end there, only at that point are we gonna pop off this up one and come all the way back here to the beginning and explore this path. That's why it's called depth first search because you explore deeply down one path until it is absolutely all the way exhausted before you come back up to do one of the original paths that you found. And again, this is exactly the same algorithm in terms of the code and the steps you're doing. The only difference between breadth first search and depth first search is the data structure you're using, breadth first search, search with the queue and depth first search with the stack. So let's go ahead and take a look at the code for depth first search and see how this plays out. So here's our dfs.java program. The import here, we just import stack and we have the exact same point class. Here we make our stack instead of a queue of points to keep track of where we're going to explore next. Everything about the maze is the same and everything about this algorithm is the same, except when we come down here, we don't say queue.add, we say stack.push. And same thing for going right and to the bottom and top. And we check if the stack is empty and print no path again. And when we get the next cell to explore, we don't remove it from the queue. Instead, we pop it off of the stack. Everything about the code is the same, except I've changed out the data structure.
So let's see what happens when we go ahead and take a run with this. I'm going to compile dfs.java and then go ahead and run dfs. And we see that we again get to the end of the maze, which is good. And let's see a look at how we got here this time. So again, we start, sorry, in the upper left hand corner. And now we go down. Let me actually put this into Vim. It'll be a little easier to do. Okay, there we go. So we start in the upper left hand corner like this and explore that way. And now we go down. And then it looks like we chose to go down first. When we get to this first fork, we went down. And now notice, unlike breadth first search, we're not trading off between two options, going down and going right. Instead, we've committed to going down and we're going to go all the way as deep along that path as we can. And then only when we hit the dead end here, at this point, do we go back to explore the right of our very original cell right off the bat when we made that first decision. It's depth for our search. We go all the way down this path and only when it runs out do we come back up and explore other options. Now we can see that we continue along this path, of course, for as far as it will take us. Skip ahead a little bit. And then we get to this choice here where we can either go again down or right and it looks like we chose down. And then again, we're going to explore all the way down. And only when this thing hits a dead end, all the way down here at the end, right here, are we gonna pop back up and explore this other path to the right as we're doing right here. So that's the difference between breadth first search and depth first search. Breadth first search uses a queue. And because of that FIFO behavior, things that you put onto the queue early are going to be explored sooner. Whereas with a stack, things that you put on early are not going to come back around because you have something else on the stack on top of that. And you only get back to the original things after everything on top of the stack has been popped off. So hopefully that makes sense. I think this is kind of a cool example because it shows the major difference in the way the algorithm works just based on changing the data structure you're using. And so now you might wonder why we have both of these algorithms and if one is better than others in certain situations. And that is true. Some, sometimes one is better and sometimes the other is better. In this case, it didn't really matter too much. It looks like depth first search saved a little bit because it didn't explore a couple paths that turned out not to have been needed. But in general, for this maze searching, I think it really just comes down to luck in terms of which one is better or worse than the other. But there are cases when one algorithm might be better suited to a task than another. In some cases, breadth first search is better because in depth first search, you can have the problem where if there's infinitely long paths, depth first search could never return. And so in this case, there's no infinitely long paths because we're always going to hit a dead end or go back where we started in a maze. But let's say you're searching for like winning moves in a game of chess. It's possible that you can have infinite loops there where you're searching through all the different moves you can make, but some sequences of moves just move you back and forth. Like you could just move a ruck to the left and then back to the right and then the left and then the right. And so some search spaces have paths that will never end. And so in those cases, depth first search can be a bad choice because if you just go down a path that's infinite, you'll never arrive at a solution, even if there is one to be found. Whereas in that case, breadth first search might work and might make more sense. On the other hand, depth first search can be way better when there's scenarios where you can kind of like maybe guess at which of multiple paths is going to be better. So in this case, we didn't do anything like weigh the different options in terms of, well, we think this one's more likely to get us to our goal because it's going to the right instead of going to the left or something like that. But if you have any search space where you think maybe one path is more promising than the other, then depth first search can be better because then you can explore the most promising paths first and see if they get you to the end. And only if they don't, can you come back to the less promising paths. So there's different scenarios where one searching algorithm is better than the other, just depending on what you're doing. All right. So there's one last thing I want to talk about today, which is not going to take very long, but I want to mention the idea of a priority queue to you. 
So now we've talked about using queues as sort of like a waiting line for data where you can sort of have sort of a queue that things are waiting in. And so let's say we put some letters inside of this queue. Um, but in this case, with a regular queue, a first in first out queue, you just take the thing that arrived most recently. You don't have any sort of like importance to the things that are waiting in the queue. But there's other times when this might not be the most appropriate thing. Like if this is the checkout line at Wegmans or another grocery store, you're gonna wanna use a regular queue. Everyone waits their turn the same amount of time. Whoever comes first gets to check out first. There's no exceptions to that. But let's say instead that you are waiting in line in the emergency room. Well, if you're there because you think you might have broken your arm and you're waiting in line, then somebody comes in after you and their leg is, let's say, like being impaled by a railroad spike or something like that, something really heinous looking, or they were in a terrible car accident or got shot. You're going to want them to go first, even though you came in before them. So some cases you don't want to just go strictly off of first come first serve sometimes there might be some idea of a priority involved and a data structure that does this is called a priority queue and in a priority queue you have two things taken into account one is when the data was added to the priority queue and another is what priority it has how like important is this thing being judged and of course, that might come into play in like a hospital situation, but it also could come into play in like an operating system. You often use a priority queue to keep track of the different processes that need time on the CPU, because some of them might be higher priority processes that need more CPU time than others. And it also turns out that there's another searching algorithm besides BFS or DFS called the A star search algorithm. And an A star search algorithm actually uses a priority queue. And it does that to sort of keep track of, like I said, sort of with depth first search, which are the most promising paths. And it uses the priority queue to sort of manage those internally. So we're not gonna talk about priority queues yet. We could implement it right now based on an array or a linked list, but we wouldn't actually do a very good job. There's actually another data structure that we're gonna talk about later in the semester called a heap. And a heap can implement a priority queue a lot more efficiently than an array or a linked list based thing can. So this is just like a teaser, some foreshadowing to later in the semester. We're gonna come back and talk about this later. All right, so I think that that is all for this class. We have on the notes page here, links to the BFS code that I showed you and also the DFS code. And then I talked a little bit about priority queues. So that's all for today. I thank you for watching this video and let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Thanks.